Isaiah 52, verses 13 to chapter 53, verse 12. Behold, my servant shall act wisely, and he shall be high and lifted up, and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human resemblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom the arm of the Lord has been revealed? For he grew up like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look on him, no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. As one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days the will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with many. And he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for transgressors. Oh my goodness. Phenomenal. The goat passage of the Old Testament, possibly the entire scriptures. So profound. So, so um, emotional. I, I, you know, I was feeling emotions as I was reading it. I was very powerful. The first thing that we need to highlight here is this. So I'm looking right now at this is background information, okay? Is that this is a the genre is what's the genre here? Okay, so um close. What would be the genre of the book? So, poetry. poetry. Yes. So, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you, so you're very close. Okay, so we're looking at major genres and then subgenres here. So maybe several could be included, but I'm thinking of if we're looking at these categories over here. So what? So what's the the major genre? Prophecy. Prophetic. Uh, yeah, so we're looking right now. So this is this is Isaiah as a whole. Okay, 
And so if we're looking at Isaiah as a whole, we have to say this is prophetic. And then within prophetic, you can have visionary, you can have narrative, you can have, you can have psalms, you can have prayers. So then now looking at the subgenre here, what would be the best if because there is some debate of all of these here, what's the closest um, that we should choose? When, so this is something very helpful. When you have the ESV, the NASB, I think the NIV, when you have a lot of parallel, we talked about from, from hermeneutics, right? If there's parallelism, most likely it's poetry, okay? It's almost always poetry if it's, if it's repetitive parallelism, okay? That's, that's like, if, that's like um, in our context, if I say, you know, like a song, we sing a song and there's poetry there or it's, there's rhythm there's repet repet repetition, it's, it's poetry. Now within poetry is also prayer or, or, or a song. And I think that's what, what Henry was mentioning too. So um, perhaps we can further define it into one of these other two, but I think the comprehensive for this section, we can at least say is, is poetry. And once we identify as poetry, the repetition makes a lot more sense. So many times it's like, so look, so let's look at an example here. Okay. Look at the repetition here in verse one, just to tell you what I'm referring to. He shall be high. He shall be lifted up. He shall be exalted, right? This is, this is, this is parallelism, right? It's, it's, it's repetition. Narrative is just going one event after another, right? And so this, it's more repeating the same thing. It's like when you're telling a story, you don't keep repeating yourself, right? In a song you do, right? We have, we have choruses, right? We have stanzas. Um, so this is really the important thing to identify here is that this is uh, a poetry. And so this is helpful. If you're preaching this sermon, each line has significance, but you don't have to have like, this, essentially what I'm trying to get at, and so maybe this is more teaching on how to preach. This is really pointing out one truth. Okay. So it's using one, two, three verbs to teach one truth. So you shouldn't have three points. Does, does everyone see that? So maybe that's helpful as, whereas the, in, in, in the epistles, like, like uh, Romans or in Hebrews one, one to four, Every line was a different major point, right? <laughs> we had seven descriptions of Jesus. Here, we don't have to do that because, because the whole idea is that these, they are parallel ideas, okay? They are parallel ideas, all right? And they're teaching one truth. So let's just talk through here. You can ask a question or make a comment here. So we have a, this is an emphatic statement. Behold, it's drawing attention to what is to follow. And then we have the identification of the, the servant, my servant. So this is the Lord. And so this is going to be, it's a title, the servant of the Lord. Now, who else in, who else in the Old Testament, what's a, what's a parallel office that describes the servant of the Lord? What's a parallel office? And maybe this helps un bring us to understand um, who this is. Who, had a, who was also called the servant of the Lord from Christology study? Who was all, also called a servant of the Lord? Moses, right? So Moses is a servant. But how, well, how do we define Moses as? So Moses is a servant. How do we define Moses as? Several, several titles or, and functions. Prophet, servant. Prophet, excellent. Also mediator. Both ways. And we say high priest also. Yeah, and so there's also there's also there's also priestly, and then there's also leadership. He was also a leader of Israel. Okay. And so essentially, what does a servant do? Fundamentally, a servant carries out the will of the master. Okay. And so in this context, Jesus is the servant of the Lord. He's carrying out the will of the Lord. Now this is prophetic. Okay. So, so, so the, the, 
The genre is prophetic. So there's, and it's poetry. So there's clarity and then ambiguity. Okay. And so Jesus is more than a servant, right? But he is the servant. All right. And so here we see in this context, the servant dying for the sins of the people, but also interceding, doing priestly duties, mediation, right? He's, he's, he's doing, carrying out the will of, of the Lord. And then also um, mediating to the Lord for on behalf of the people. Okay. So there's multiple facets going on here. So we can look at it and in, in, we can look at it in, in these categories here. Okay. Um, but then in the new Testament, we realize that the ser- that, that the servant of the Lord, that Christ is so much more, right? He's so much more. All right. But he is nonetheless. Okay. And so the point that I just want to bring out here really is that, is that um, this servant idea is part of, it's, it's fundamental to who the Christ is. Okay. And so the, 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 this is a future act, right? So this is shall act future action. And so if this is a future action coming back here, fundamental ideas here. Okay. So now we're looking at, we're looking at types of sentences here. Okay. So if we're looking at types of sentences, then let me just, um, this is going to be a prophetic declaration or a prophecy. Okay. So the key for this being a prophecy is number one, there's several keys to identifying a prophecy. So you should write these down. Maybe I'll have a, a handout later. Number one, God is speaking or an angel or a prophet is speaking on behalf of God. Number two, it's an, an, an action. Most of the time it's an action. And number three, it's future. A prophecy. <laughs> All right. And then um, number four, we can say that prophecy always deals with salvation and or judgment. Okay, so so those are the four. Those are the four. Sir, uh, question regarding the servant. Yeah. So the, uh, it does it does mean also that in Triune God there are uh, there are kind of offices in Triune God in the economy of for salvation. Okay, but not within the 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 Trinity, if that makes sense. All right. So we can speak of it within the economy of salvation, their acts of bringing about salvation, the decrees concerning salvation. That's, that's the extent that we can speak of it as, yeah. So God the Father has a different role than God the Son and God the Spirit, okay? But within the Trinity, within their being, within, within, within the eternal Trinity, there is, there is none, okay? Great question. All right, so here, I'm going to put, I'm, so then looking at this here, we can easily say then, that this is a prophecy, prophecy, prophecy as well. And there's really two ideas, one and two, right? The first is that my servant will act wisely. This is, this is manner. Prudently. I think, I think the word was prudent that Kuyabobo used. And then also he is, uh, lifted up high and exalted. Now, when we think, so if, if, if you could imagine for a moment, let's put aside the rest of the passage. Okay, let's put aside the rest. Of the, if, if, if you could try to do that, okay? Imagine you're reading this for the first time. You have not read the subsequent context. Being high, lifted up and exalted, what do you think that this, what do you think that this refers to? generally speaking king king Lord's yeah position king. yeah king Lord's. um high position excellent what else lordship priest 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 yeah so even putting high aside priest, yeah high so, priest. oh yeah yeah yes yes so there's so so high priest is is the high priest signifies right this signifies authority right He's over all the rest of the priests. He's the, he's the highest priest, right? Okay. So that's what it typically means. Okay. But what's so amazing here is that this, so he, so he will act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, shall be exalted. 
and then but then but then the rest goes into this humility <laughs> humiliation does everyone see that so it's like uh so so look here look here his his appearance was so marred his form was beyond that of human resemblance beyond beyond that of the the children of mankind so this is just a terrible so then the question is you know does this does this being high and lifted up does this being exalted does this just refer down the road and and no doubt there's an interpretation there that would say oh no this is post cross this is already seeing the fruits of his labor net, net, you know that's when he's going to be high and lifted up and and perhaps there's a nuance of that you know perhaps there's a sense of that but the question i want to ask is how does the new testament interpret this okay and so the answer is going to be found in the gospel of john in the gospel of john so let's go to john 3:14 John three fourteen. Sir Tim, Sir Tim, go ahead. Uh, does does this description uh, indicates the uh, describes the appearance of Jesus Christ on the cross or ah. before before the cross? Yeah, so so that's where we're going to. You're, you're preempting me. So go to John three fourteen. I'm going to bring it up in my markup Bible here. Um, I'm getting preempted by by Mark. Very insightful. So this is preceding the great crucifixion before the exaltation, before the famous Ooh. passage of God, of God loving the world, right? Look at, look at what the word of the Lord says. Okay, look at what the word of the Lord says here. Jesus speaking, truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the son of man. Look at this here. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up. So if you recall, this, is, this serpent in the wilderness was on a cross and it was to, to save Israel from their sin. They had to look on the serpent to be saved, right? This then is a comparison or a type pointing to the son of man being lifted up. My servant will be high, but it's not in the context of enthronement. It's in the context of sacrifice. And so people will claim that this, this is a bad interpretation of Isaiah, but it actually fits quite well in the Old Testament, especially since you have a type in the Pentateuch, right? Moses lifting up the serpent is prophesying of a future greater salvation in which not some brass or bronze serpent is lifted up on a cross. God's eternal son will be lifted on the cross, the God-man Jesus Christ will be lifted up and save all of us from our sins. And if you were ever in doubt and said, Tim, I don't believe you. I still think that's a stretch. I'm not saying that you would say that. Let's go to John chapter eight. John eight twenty eight. So now we're looking at a theme through John's gospel. Look at John eight twenty eight. Jesus said to them, when you have lifted up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak as the father taught me. This is, this is referring to, this is referring to the Pharisees and they did, they, they were going to lift him up. And of course the reference here is on, on the cross. Again, you could say, Tim, it's a hard read. It's a hard read, Tim. Let's go to one more passage. Uh, I hope wait, that wait. yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah. Sir, can, can I can I comment on yeah, John eight twenty eight? Yeah. Um, actually, quoting someone's comment <laughs> in MacArthur Study Bible, he comments here that having he said having refused to accept him by faith and having nailed him to the cross, 
they would one day awaken to the terrifying realization that this one whom they despised was the one whom they should have worshipped. Yeah. Yeah. So, so actually, you, you are quite right when you said um, he will be lifted up, not in enthronement or king yeah. something, but also in humility. Because yeah. um, the, the John also speaks the same language yeah. with Isaiah. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, so so you're drawing attention to the to the the quoting of Isaiah um, with the Pharisees. Excellent. No, I, that's a good quote, um, Bon. And yeah, so I think it's really fair. Now I got one more passage. There's one more passage that it becomes even stronger. So let's go now to John chapter. John chapter 12, verse 32, John 12, 32. And this is the nail in the coffin. And really um, Bond's quoting of, of John MacArthur is, is really excellent because this is, this is also where they are seeking to destroy Jesus. But look here at verse, at verse 32, John 12, 32. Look at verse 29. The crowd that stood there heard the voice that thundered and others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And so you're thinking, oh, this is enthronement, right? You're thinking this is enthronement here, right? Lifted up from the earth. <laughs> Right. This is a. Uh, this has to be enthronement in heaven, right? Above the earth, right? This has to be enthronement. Wrong. Look down here, verse thirty-three. This was to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, "You have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up?" And so. The whole point here is that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? So this lifted up terminology is, is, a, is, a, is a typical terminology to crucifixion is what I'm trying to get at. Because this is a contradiction. In their mind, it's a contradiction. How can you say that, how can you say the Son of Man is lifted up? He, the Christ remains forever. Coming back to our passage tonight, this John understands this. So we have John 3, 14. We have John 8, 28. And we have 12, 32 to, to 34. And this is all referring to, I believe that Jesus was quoting Isaiah with the lifting up. Of course, the serpent is also tight, but I think that he was literally quoting from Isaiah, knowing what he had to do. He knew that if he was going, if he was the servant of the Lord, he knew that if he was called by God, he knew that the way to a, the will of the Father was to go this route. And so that's why he's literally quoting Isaiah 52. And then John, the apostle, is quoting on. on on, on his behalf as well. Any questions or comments? Is that making sense? So moving on here now, look at this statement here. Many were astonished. As many as were astonished at you. This, is, this word is that of amazed, or we could say shocked. They were shocked at you his appearance was so marred beyond human uh, 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 resemblance. So this is the idea of incredible torture and suffering. His form is beyond that of the children. He's unrecognizable. You know, I wasn't going to share this, but but uh, but but I think I will. So so we 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 drove to we drove to Connecticut. Um, this is a, this is maybe more of a graphic story. So if, if it, 
bothers you, then I'm just going to give you the warning right now. Maybe you want to mute or you want to just, just um, turn off the sound. But I do think it's an important because it was the first time for me really to experience this. So I was, we were driving to Connecticut and we're going on, it's a, it's a big, it's like the SLEX and Lex going through New York city. So we literally will drive up New Jersey through New York into Connecticut. And it's like a, at times it's a four lane highway on either side. So it's a massive 95. It's the biggest road on the East coast. And so it's like the SLEX and Lex. And so we're, we, but we, we left 4 30 AM to get there because I was preaching and we were sharing and, um, there was two accidents. And so we were able to go through both accidents. The one accident had just happened. And this is like maybe 530 in the morning. So and it's, it's Sunday morning. So probably people were out, you know, you know, having entertainment They're they're doing whatever people will do on Saturday night drinking and partying. And there was a car that was just, it was totaled. And there was no windshield as we drove by. And they had shut down the whole it was like a two lane uh, overpass. And there was just like a body on the street and it had just happened. And it, the body was so mangled. It just looked like a lump of flesh. It was, it's very even hard for me to describe it right now. You know, in some, in, in some ways that, that to me pictures what's going on here, just this is just disturbing me sharing just blood and just, you couldn't really recognize it. It was, it was, it just, it just disturbed me. And, um, I think the, the, the suffering of the servant, Jesus, I, I don't think we can imagine. And I think, I think the, the, the passion of the, of, the, of, the, of the cross is just so powerful, an imagery of what he went through for us. And um, for me, I was visibly bothered seeing that. And, and someone passed on the attorney. We, we hope and trust that maybe he knew the Lord. Um, but it's incredibly powerful and and just sobering. So by the way, sir, um, my observation, sir, that in the preceding verse, the verse 13, that he will be high and lifted up, it's also talking about his humiliation, not only the king, the lordship. Yeah, no. So, 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 yeah, so we, so that's really good. So this here is referring to fundamentally the, the humiliation. His, so we can think of, two aspects we'll see later in philippians 2 5 to 11 christ's humiliation and christ's exaltation there's two and so this fundamentally is dealing with his humiliation and what we'll see here it's more than just on the cross it's him bearing our sorrows and our griefs in his life his earthly ministry it's beyond just the cross a hundred percent excellent excellent comment um, Paul, thank you for adding that. So yeah, we want to really highlight this here. This is concerning his humiliation. And this is begins with the incarnation and ends with his death before the resurrection. Um, so we have here this description here. Okay. And this description here is again, these are two descriptions. These are two descriptions here. And, um, and this is again, parallelism. So these are synonymous. In this instance, they're synonymous. And, and, and the purpose being for emphasis to describe the extent of his appearance. Okay, everyone tracking there with me? So this is specifically, and you could look at these two as being, this is the, the explanation. Why were they astonished? Why were they astonished? Because his appearance was so marred they could not even see him. He did, probably, he, he did not, he, it was beyond the children of mankind. So he was not even recognizable as a human being. And so this, so practically speaking here, let's get practical here. Concerning human suffering. When someone is suffering, we don't want to give them the theological answer. We don't want to say, oh, you need to trust God. That is part of it. And there's a time to share that. But before we share that, we need to empathize with people. Because until you experience the suffering, you, you recognize when someone shares a terrible situation, the response is not just to give the answer, but to empathize with them. And that's something I've struggled with in the past. I'm trying to struggle. I'm trying to, to be more sensitive and just really 
understand what people are going through. And so in this text here, you say, why is there so much detail? And, and what I would say is that when it comes to human suffering, Christ experienced it. Jesus experienced an incredible amount of human suffering. He has, he has borne our suffering in his body. He has borne our grief in him. And so people will try to use human suffering as a way to say, the Bible is not true. It doesn't exist, but God doesn't care. He does care. And no one has experienced the suffering to this extent. So powerful. So powerful. Incredible assurance that Christ and God has gone through what we have, right? Hebrews, he's experienced temptation and suffering, like, like his brothers in every regard, so that he can be a merciful high priest. Let's move on here. Look at the purpose here, or the inference. We could say here inference. Through, so this is, this, is, this is describing him in the, the suffering and crucifixion, right? And the crucifixion, and then look at look at what, what look at what's going on here. Look at the so. So there's the there's the so, so, and look at his action here. Fundamental action. He shall. So this is the work of the Christ. He shall sprinkle many nations. Someone want to make a comment? What does sprinkle signify? What do you think is going on here? Let's let's think for a minute. Let's. Let's meditate upon this word. What are washing. your thoughts? Okay, washing. Yeah. Okay, great. Maybe grace. 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 Yeah. Or blessing. Or blessing. Okay, possibly, but think about what. Oh, okay. So you're thinking of it in a a, a grace or blessing context. Okay, let's think about that. Start all. Okay, so grace. there's huge there's huge debate on what the word is. And starter, startle is coming from a different Hebrew word. And so actually, in this instance, though, I'm very strongly against using that other word that's translated startle. And you're going to see why in a moment, because it doesn't really fit the context. So you have, you have crucifixion and suffering going on here. So let's think. So it, it, it can be a blessing or a washing if you're thinking about water, right? If you're thinking about water. That's possible. But is this sprinkling that of water? Looking at the context and looking blood. at the crew. Yeah, so it's blood. So this, is, this blood. is blood. This is blood, the sprinkling of blood. And this, is, this word is actually used in sacrificial context. So the word is used always in sacrificial context. So, so, these other translations are possible, but I want to push against that because it doesn't fit the context. The context is the suffering and the giving of a life, a sacrifice, and it's going to be further confirmed. So if Christ is on the cross, it's, on the, it's the shedding of his blood where there's remission of sins, right? The reason for the, the, the presence of a bloody sacrifice is that life is in the blood and there needs to be a sacrifice. So he, with his blood, sprinkles, cleanses many nations. Redemption. So all, yeah, so excellent. So we have redemption. We have sacrifice. Big word, though. We have atonement. Atonement. Wow. And notice here. Old Testament, right? This is not plan B. This is not a plan B like, oh, the Jews rejected Christ. And so now he plan B is salvation for the church. No, from the Old Testament, from the, from the promise of Abraham, the whole world will be blessed. This is the Gentiles. Literally, the, the Hebrew word is, is the word for Gentile, goyim. The servant of the Lord's work was never just for Israel. It was for all the nations from the beginning. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. 
Now, why do you think that, what do you think is going on there? What's, what's, what's your thought there? Judgment. The proud. <laughs> so negatively, it could be like judgment, right? Negatively, it could be judgment. Positively, I, I do think it's probably more positive and there's no words to describe. It's, it's you're speechless, right? You're so blessed, you're speechless. I think maybe that has more, it's debated, okay? So I do think that this is in a, a, a positive context in the context of salvation. Because remember, Isaiah, uh, Psalm 2, kiss the son, worship the son, serve the son, lest his wrath is quickly kindled and you perish along the way. <laughs> to the kings, to the kings. So I think that this is a call to the kings to, to, to shut up and, 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 to, and to accept the, the salvation of the Lord. This is a reason here because of him. So look at this here, okay? So then this is a super complicated fra two phrases here. We want to think about this. That which has not been told to them, they see. That which has not, they have not heard, they understand. And so it's like, what in the world is going on here? What in the world is going on? And so I do think this is, so bear with me. Looking at, I had to look at commentaries to try to think about what's going on here. So this is debated, but I think what it's saying here is that they've never been told this before, but, but look here, who has believed what he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. Okay. And so we have to look at all of these in this, in this parallel context here. And so this is what I think is going on here. This is a, a new, a new message that they have never heard before, that which they have never heard before. That would be the translation. That which they have never heard before, they see. That which they have never heard, they understand. And so I think that this is the, the proclamation of the gospel, the work of the Son. And in this, they see. In this, they understand. And this is a, this is a, a, a faith belief context, right? The Pharisees were blind. They could not see. They were hard to hear, but hear that which they have not, that which has not, they've never heard before. That which has not been told to them. They see, they see it. They understand it. So let's quickly look at a parallel passage where it's negative. And so you can see the contrast here. Okay. So if, if we go to Isaiah to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6 is the call of Isaiah. This is before judgment. And this is when, uh, when Israel in chapter 1 to 5, Israel's reprobate. The, they are the ox knows his owner. My people do not know their master. <laughs> they, they, are, they are full of lies and hypocrisy that Jerusalem has become a den of thieves. And so look at verse 4 here. So then after after uh, Isaiah's, um, after Isaiah is commissioned, look at what God, the Lord says in Isaiah six, verse nine and following. The command is to go. The command is to go and say to this people, keep hearing, but do not understand. Keep seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of the people dull, their ears heavy, blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be healed. So this is judgment, a, a, a prophecies of judgment and exile. Don't let the people hear. Don't let the people understand how long, O oh Lord, until the cities lie waste. So this is, this is the, the prophecy of judgment, right? So look at the contrast. That which they have not been told, they see. <laughs> you see the complete opposite? So in, in Isaiah 6, 
The people are unbelieving, unrepentant, and God prophesies judgment. Here, the people have already been judged. Now the prophecy is salvation. And so that which they have not been told, they see. That which they have not heard, they understand. And so this is, this is a context of salvation in the, in the, the message of the, 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 of the prophet Isaiah. It, it could be the Jewish rulers, but it could also be the connection here is kings of many nations. You're all saying sim and the similar thing in different ways. I agree with you. And, and I think the big thing is just the, 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 the shutting of the mouth is just complete shock about how, it, how this came about, right? Because never in the history of the world was a king crucified and then enthroned in heaven. Never. And it's just a shocking story. And you're right. They're believing. They have the faith, the eyes of faith, the eyes of their heart are open. And it's just, what do you say? You just stand back in, in, in speechless and you just take it all in, right? When you go to watch the beautiful sunset, the gore, you just sit there and you don't talk. You just watch the sunset. Diba? Because it's just... This, that, that, yeah. That, that right. reminds me of, of Job's reaction when God asked him, where were you when I created the universe? Where were you when I laid down the foundation of the earth? Job said, I will put my mouth shut. No, that's really good. Nothing to say. You have nothing to say. Excellent. In, in our case, it's like saying, oh. I rest my case. <laughs> yeah. No further questions, no further argument. Something like that. Yeah. Once you agree with someone, you stop arguing, right? Maybe it's stopping the argument. <laughs> so it is true that we will reign, but I do think that, in, in especially in the Old Testament, the promise is, is that kings will come from the womb of, will, will come from Abraham's, you know, and so there's referring to, the, to kings in, in, the, in the nation of Israel, but there's also that idea that the nations, the nations, and I do think this is literal. Diba, because you can say all the small, poor people, they believe, but that still isn't tra transcending all. If the kings, literal kings, and we have that historically, take it or leave it. We don't know all the details. We don't know the heart, but like Constantine, he was Christian. How many kings through the centuries are Christian? Okay. No doubt. Some of them were scandal, uh, were, 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 were scoundrels, right? But you clearly have kings that are believing. You have leaders that are believing, right? Um, even in, in, in U.S. government, U, uh, U.K. government, French government, German, Philippines, right? Monty Pacquiao, he's not a king, but he's a leader, right? He's, he's a strong Christian. <laughs> um, that verse also, sir, could be possible connected in eschat uh, eschatology. So this is already eschatology here. This is prophesying of the last days, right? In these last days, he has spoken to us th from his son. So eschatology is last study of last times. And so this promise is already speaking to the last times when the Messiah comes and dies and, and saves the people. So you're, you're there. Eschatology is related. So really, we can think here of, that's a, good, that's a good point. We can think here of, if you're looking at topic, there is uh, salvation, uh, soteriology. There's also eschatology because it's prophetic. Okay. And then of course, theology. And then Christology. Come on. We're in Christology right now. Come on. This passage is so many different relationships. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, so, so already so, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because he sees, he sees. Yeah. So you also have already not yet. Yeah. Because he sees the, the fruit of his labor but but not yet consummated right not so even we'll see next week the the fruit of his labor goes all the way to the to the very end like what paul is saying to to when they're in the land they're prosperous right and so but already now we're experiencing that benefit so there's just so much i mean maybe this is just i'm i'm just feeding so much to you there, there's so much to th think about and contemplate here it's late though uh, any other comments or questions we're going to end it here and we'll finish it next week any other comments or questions uh, reflections from this. John MacArthur said, shutting their mouths at his exaltation, human leaders in the highest places will be speechless and in awe before the once despised servant.
Yeah, no, that's really good. And let's close on that. We'll leave it on that quote, <laughs> quotation right there. That everyone, their mouths will be shut. Hold up. How about this? Let's go right here. I'm going to do it. We're, we're not going to close on, on John MacArthur's quote. As, as great as John MacArthur is, we're going to close on the word of God. And I just had a revelation. I just had a revelation here in the gospel, the proclamation of the gospel. Um, now, this is in the judgment, but this is this is perhaps also what's going on here. So Romans 3.20. Okay, Romans 3.20. So this is the climax you know, everyone's sinned. There's none righteous, no, not one. They, they all have, they have the, the mouth of an Oakland grave. They're, they're sepulchers. They, they have venom on their, at, their, their, their tongues. Verse 18, uh, verse 17, the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God in their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth might be shut. <laughs> And the whole world will be held accountable to God. And so on the cross, every mouth is shut. Accent there is on kings. I wanna, I'm gonna hold on to the king, the king component there. But when everything comes into reality, there will be no more arguments like like Kuya Bobo is saying. Those that believe will just be shocked and just standing in the in the grace of God. Those that are guilty and condemned, there'll be no excuse. They'll stand condemned in their judgment. And so this is just, this is big, this is big picture. This is big picture here. He shall sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths. They have no words to say. From that which has not been told, they see. And that which they have not heard, they understand. 